You are listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of icmforum.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Chris, and in this episode, we are going to dive into Mikhail Kalatosov's almost miraculous late life trio of films The Cranes Are Flying, Leather Never Sent, and I Am Cuba. I, I say miraculous, as despite working from the late 20s, with the exception of his two oldest surviving films, Salt for Swanisha and Nail in the Boot, the, the films he made for, for more than 30 years rarely get any acclaim. And, and then these three films arrived, and uh, just calling them stunning would be a complete understatement. The way these films move and feel, the visual tension, the power of the camera movements, the the tragic human drama, and the increasingly impressive long takes, which, by the way, kept getting uh, Moss films to literally just issue charges of formalism (laughs) against Galatuso, because uh, making films look great is shockingly not something (laughs) the Soviet Union was that keen on if they felt it went above the uh, messaging, let's say. Um, All of these things just culminated in three films that look incredible move incredibly, and with Soy Cuba in particular, I mean, that film, to me at least, belongs on the short list of the best shot films of all time. So, so before we start going into these uh, three films, just in chronological order, and just dive into them in detail, what is it to you that makes these three films stand out? Everyone, it's Tom here. I absolutely love the work of Mikhail Kalatozov. His Films that I have seen are just incredible, from the beautiful cinematography to the powerful narratives. Something that's really just so powerful um, about all three of these films. They look amazing, the performances are brilliant, and as you mentioned, Chris, the camera work in all of them is absolutely phenomenal. The long takes are utterly mesmerising. And really, I I think that all three of these films are near masterpieces, if not masterpieces. They're just excellent examples of of pure cinema for me. Well, I think what makes these films interesting is that Kalatosov is, as you alluded to, such a formalist. And he is in a system that kind of theoretically despises formalism. And that kind of tension makes the films really interesting. And obviously, they're technically insane and amazing on, on that aspect. So they're really beautiful films to watch and interesting films to, to analyze. Yeah, I completely agree there. And I think that's actually why his uh, older films don't get the praise that these uh, three do. Because if you go back to uh, the early 30s and you do look at uh, Salt Force, Vanisha and uh, Neon the Boot, those are really formalist films. Like Those are stunning Soviet montage these great silent films that just look spectacular. And then he kind of got swept up in, in the Moss film system, I guess, where he made um, these far more conventional films, the film that the studio and the government would expect. Some melodrama, some charming comedies, all of them well shot, but there's nothing uh, that spectacular. And then suddenly you, you get these films. And I do think that a part of the credit here has to go to uh, Kalatosov's cinematographer, Sergei Urusevsky, who actually did something that, that goes through all of these three films that is it, quite incredible. He more or less, I wouldn't say pioneered handheld camera movement because it was used before, but I think we need to remember that The Cranes uh, Are Flying is from 1957, so that's the same year that Bu Search and the uh, like from the first French New Wave film from the Claire Group at least came out. In the rest of the world, this was more or less a time where like cinema verite started coming in, and you had these really blunt handheld movements. Where here you have uh, these absolutely stunning, a- a- almost flawless long takes that just move majestically. 
it doesn't compare to anything I can think of in the mid 50s in terms of handheld camera movement. And it matches up with really the best of <laughs> the, the 60s as well. It, it, it's just insane when he, he, you know, our leads run up the stairways or the camera just moves around them in specific ways. It, it's just incredible. The camera really feels free. And that's just something that really, to me, separates this set of film. And it just gets more and more impressive as they move on from almost all other films in this uh, time period. Well, we watching Cranes of Flying. I also thought about uh, the Nouvelle Vague and how they must have been, in part, quite influenced by this film. But I also saw um, Romer quotes, because he was a critic at the time still, where he mentions uh, Max Ophuls, right? I actually haven't seen any Max Ophuls films, but I know he's really renowned for these elaborate camera movements. So I guess, would that be maybe equivalent? I assume you guys have seen some of his films. Oh, yes. I mean, I think that's actually a really good comparison. Yeah. I mean, uh, Lula Mentes, especially, like, there's some of the long takes there. Like, those are absolutely incredible. So, so yeah, that, that's a very good comparison. And yes, I, I, I guess you could put uh, those two directors up against each other there when it comes to just uh, really impressive out of this world uh, camera movements. So I think we can just more or less dive straight into uh, the topic at hand here and start with the cranes are flying a, what I would call it, it's a, it's a beautiful tragedy. It's a love story set in the midst of World War II where two starstruck lovers are separated. What are your takes on this one? Yeah, this is an extremely impressive film technically and it's kind of a film that is continuously showing off right uh, yes. <laughs> every other scene is like look at what i can do you've never seen this before or, or like very 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 rarely and it's kind of stunning to see this coming from a soviet film at the time and it's uh, i guess something that could only have happened because of stalin's death but right? there was this whole slight like opening up of Soviet society and of some of the systems that allowed this kind of thing to happen. And you can feel, as I mentioned earlier, the tension in this film of kind of balancing this kind of formal freedom with, I think, the narrative of the film, which feels to me like it's quite controlled from a, a propagandist point of view. But I guess mm -hmm. I, I'm curious what you guys think about that. Well, I, I just completely agree with that. I mean, I think that's one of those things that Soviet formalists had to deal with for a lot of it is that you can shoot a beautiful film, but the message has to be on point. I, I guess uh, charges of formalism aren't as uh, terrible as charges of uh, subversion, let's say. If you go back, to, uh, like, I, I know you guys haven't seen Solfer's Vanisha. It's, a, it's about a 60-minute film. I, I actually rewatched it uh, last week. It's beautiful. You can see it's the same director. But that also just ends in this extreme propaganda message. And the nail in the boot is ridiculous. And if you go back to the films that were really free formally, which you essentially have to go back to the, to the 20s and the silent era. You could always see that when the film was truly visually spectacular, there was always some message of either Soviet progress or driving home the glory of the revolution. And here, that's still very much present. The, the heroism of World War II, the glory of the war, uh, the, again, you know, the, the portrayal of the one who goes to war, the one who doesn't. It, it's very on point. It, it ends in a very specific way. I'm not sure if you want to spoil, but uh, the messaging is coming through. And e even more so than the next two films we'll discuss a bit later, which is probably why, while I think this is a wonderful film, it's my least favorite of these three. But I think for you, Tom, it's your favorite, right? That's right, Chris. The Cranes of Flying is, without a doubt, my favorite of all three of these films. And I think one thing that's interesting is that as well as the um, political perspective, I think all three films can be enjoyed aside from that, just focusing on these quite simple um, straightforward stories, but told in a, a brilliant manner. So whether you're someone who just wants to enjoy the magic of the cinema or whether you're someone who wants to dig into the perspective and the, the political background in the films, uh, all three of these films have, have a lot to offer. I think one thing that, that Matteo mentioned is that, that is brilliant as well is just the technical mastery that's present in The Cranes of Flying. Now, the first time I watched it, 
I was just immersed in the magic of the storytelling and, and the, the power of this incredible story. But the second time that I watched it, I was utterly stunned by the, the technical achievements on show. Um, as I think you mentioned, Chris, the, the scene where the camera follows the main character, Veronica, up the stairs as she runs around. It's just stunning how the, the, the camera moves up and there's so many incredible shots. It, it is just one of those films that leaves you floored just looking at it, thinking how on earth has, has this been achieved? And the, the black and white cinematography is, is beautiful. There's so many incredible fades as well, where two scenes are just blended seamlessly to en enhance the, the storytelling. And the performances as well are excellent. Not just the main cast, but I also thought that there's a lot of emotion that it comes in purely from people's expressions, just extras who were in these crowded scenes, which are hectic and chaotic. And the camera kind of lingers on these individual people. And it's, it's almost at times as if, if you watch an incredible silent film where, you know, the, the dialogue isn't necessarily important and it's just looking at the, the expressions of the people involved. So, yeah, this is one of my favourite films of all time. Not just my favourite of these three films. And I know that there are some issues that you both have with the, the film. So I'm curious to see why it's not quite a, a perfect film from your perspectives. Well, well, before I hark on some of negativity, just to be clear, I think it's a truly magnificent film. Uh, I, I think what you're saying there, Tom, uh, that it, it feels closer to a silent film it, is very true. I, I, I think for a lot of stuff, it, it's almost like his career skipped 30 years and we're back in, say, Nail on the Boot. Like th th that kind of expressiveness. And with the cinematographer, uh, I think it's also worth noting that uh, his main inspiration was uh, Edward uh, Tisse, uh, which I think is how that's pronounced, who was the cinematographer for uh, Eisenstein. And, uh, you know, you, you can kind of see some of that in these films too, you know, the, the great way that the Eisenstein films used to move. And yes, the way it looks on faces, the way it composes faces together, that's something you're going to see in all of these three films too. Uh, that's utterly uh, incredible. I mean, I, I love how it almost warps the faces a little bit. Like, the lens can sometimes get so close, especially like in so, some of the early scenes where, you know, you have the army parade and they're moving and uh, our uh, woman lead tries to see her fiance, and she, you follow her through the crowd as she climbs up through, uh, to this fence as she holds on to the bars and she looks through and you kind of get her face sticking through. I mean, those shots are stunning and how close the camera always gets to people's faces. Uh, it's very much something you would see in silent films. And the fact that the camera is so free and the way it moves, you can get from crowd shots to, you know, uh, body shots and then so slowly into a close-up. Um, it, it's something really special. I, I just have to say that. And also on the camera movements, one of the films, especially when we follow the army and, you know, see them in the moors, uh, one of the films it reminded me of was uh, I Was Childhood a little bit. Very similar uh, choice in you know, dramatic cinematography, some of the camera movements and some of just the angles, you know, where you kind of get characters at the more at the bottom of the screen, like you, you almost tilt uh, the camera sideways a little bit to get more dramatic shots. And uh, again, like you know, Ivan Sheldon is five years later, and a lot of camera development, a lot of film production changes. It, it's just once again, I just have to repeat that this is just such a truly impressive film uh, that just lives and breathes in, in, in an incredible way. I think it's the sound of mud that uh, automatically makes me think of Tarkovsky. So yeah, I, I didn't think of that. <laughs> yes. um, I, it's interesting what you mentioned, Tom, about looking at the technical achievement more the second time around. I think it was the reverse for me, maybe because because I had heard so much about, oh, there are, there are these amazing shots in this film. So when the first time I watched it, I was kind of just watching the te technical mastery and never really got into... The story, which is what kind of kept me at a distance. And so we watching it this time. I was really trying to make an effort of trying to see how the technique, the, the formalism was serving the story. And I think it, it does perhaps my favorite shot in the film, but it's not so much serving the story, but it's serving a point. It's around that same, that same scene you mentioned when everyone is leaving off for war and 
we have this tracking shot where we see just a bunch of people parting in, in different ways, right? You have people who are crying, holding each other. You also have this guy who is saying, oh, do you have the order for, I think it's cauliflower or something, right? For, for the army. You kind of have this depiction of what it's this moment in time in a bunch of faces, a bunch of different stories in like 45 seconds. And I think that's quite a remarkable shot. And just in general, the really uh, heightened nature of the way Kalatoz films a lot of these scenes, it, it's often trying to, I think, I would say paper over some of the, the stories, maybe his weaknesses, like, um, the decision that, uh, how, what's her name? That, uh, Veronica makes when, uh, she's in Leningrad, right? And Leningrad is being bombed. She makes a key decision there. And, uh, well, one could argue whether, whether or not it's a decision, but anyway, you have this really emphatic way that Kalatozov films it. And I think it's meant, to justify what is happening, or not justify it, but to, to explain why it's happening. It's so big and grand that you're meant to kind of go with it. And I don't think it entirely works, but it's a, quite a valiant effort. And it works in, in, in other places of the film. And of course, we've got uh, at war, there's also a significant event. I mean, I don't know how much we want to not spoil it. Maybe, maybe we could, uh, because I do want to discuss the ending at some point. Yeah, I mean, we, we can talk about some of the other uh, smaller negatives here first, and then, uh, then go into the ending and just spoil everything with a nice little uh, spoiler disclaimer. Um, the one thing that, not necessarily the one thing, maybe the slight propaganda aspects as well, but one of the things that uh, makes me love this a little bit less than the next two, uh, it, it also harks back a little bit to silent aesthetics, but it's the... Not going to say over the top, but the kind of very simplistic way that Kalatsov chooses to show certain things, like the very opening, which is, again, just visually breathtaking, uh, the way it's shot, with the lo lovers running on the streets, the street cleaner comes up and the water sprays around them, etc. That That's absolutely gorgeous to look at, but it's also this kind of just, oh, let's show two people in love, they're going to be jumping around the street and they're going to be looking happy. Those kind of very ultra simplistic, almost animated, almost cartoonish ways of doing it, those put me slightly, it took me slightly out of the film. I, again, beautiful, love it, but it's just these slight little things that didn't push this completely up to a top favorite for me. Yeah, these characters are not so much characters as they are archetypes. Yeah, I think you're completely right there. Definitely. I, I would agree with your perspective on the opening scene as as well Chrissy. I mean it's important to establish the love between the two characters and it does that very quickly which is needed because the war obviously separates them and we don't get to spend too much time with them together as a, as a couple but it does feel like almost like it's a musical or a fairy tale I was thinking of La La Land when I watched the first screen <laughs> last night. I, I, I couldn't help I, think, I don't know it was a combination of the music and these high shots and it, it is a vast contrast to to the rest of the film. Really, is is it? I, I don't know. Do you feel like like it is? I think like the whole film is on this level. I, I, but I don't know it because I think it's the mood that it creates because it's kind of like this happiness and this fairy tale. But then, as soon as the gloom and doom starts, it kind of becomes a different beast from from my perspective. I mean, the style of filming obviously remains the same. But it's, it's the mood that's conveyed that I think that is the, there's a vast difference in. Well, I guess it becomes a tragedy, but I would say the way the film deals with a uh, key character's death, for example, is very similar, right? It's very much the idea of death that is repre represented. Mm, yes, but I think it's a difference between showing the idea of something and being a bit more, say, cartoonish. Yeah. One comparison I actually thought about when I saw this film, um, and I'm not sure if this is going to be offensive or not. Some people might think it's a compliment, but I, I almost thought a little bit of Aronofsky uh, in just the very overt way he's uh, is just bringing home some of the point. It's just very effective, very kind of, there's no subtlety in just how certain things are expressed here. So I like Aronofsky. So I don't mind things but not being subtle. I, you know, I think subtlety is sometimes overrated. And I like that opening scene. I, I, I like some of what... I, th I think if you want to have a film that's heightened, uh, I, I think that can work. I just think this film kind of betrays its own 
main character by the time it's finished. So that that's more where I have a problem with it. And it's generally the way that, yes, it's heightened, but the characters, like, they're very static, is, is how I would put it, mm. right? You, you meet them once, and you know everything you have to know about them, except <laughs> maybe for Veronica. And that, mm. I think, is a little frustrating for me. Even though, again, I should say, I should stress, like Chris, I like this film. You know, how can you not like this film if you're a cinephile? It's just <laughs> so, so impressive to watch. It's just, mm. there's always something going on. It, yeah, you know, I, I do like it. I just don't, don't love it. Mm. Yeah, I can see what you mean there. Yeah, it is heightened. Uh, the characters are archetypes and that might not work as well for everyone. But I guess this is a good point to move into spoiler territory because you talked a little bit about how you feel the film is betraying uh, our lead character of Veronica. Let's put the spoiler uh, warning up here and uh, just maybe we can just break down why you think that is. Spoiler warning. Yeah, so, well, it's, it's, it's the ending mostly. It's not just the ending, but it's mostly the ending. Because, of course, the ending is this celebration of, oh, yes, we'll, we'll rebuild. As Veronica learns for certain that her, her beloved fiancé died at, at the front, she is, of course, very sad. And so this guy comes to, to, to say, oh, there's a speech, right, made by um, Boris's friend, all about, basically, we're going to rebuild this nation after the war and never go to war again. And it's a very idealistic, very propagandist uh, message. And she apparently is convinced by this and starts giving out flowers to everyone. And it's great. And uh, we're going to all start again stronger from this war. And I don't believe for a second that this character feels this. She's still stuck in this horrible marriage. Nothing has changed for her. Like, I, I don't buy it for a second I, that she would be swayed in this way. She is still fully in a tragedy, but we are meant to believe that uh, all, all, all ends well, or at least that there's some hope at the end of the tunnel, but I don't see the hope for this character in particular. Uh, but I don't know how you guys feel about it. I agree that that is potentially the message that the film is trying to convey. But for me, I don't interpret it as that way. I mean, you see, even though she's given out these flowers, she's kind of got this tragic, haunting expression on her face. It's, it, her face has almost gone blank. It's as if, you know, she doesn't want to accept the truth. And she's trying to, to bury that, but she's struggling with it. And I feel that in the moment, she's trying to continue and carry on but I, I feel like you know maybe shortly after the the camera fades away she'd be back to crying struggling to get over the tragedy it, it seems kind of strange to say putting on a, a brave face because I don't think that's what she's doing but I, I think it's just she's just become overwhelmed with the experience of what has happened and um, I don't know if I've expressed myself very clearly on that point but it that's kind of my view on the ending yeah, I have mixed feelings on uh, the ending, and uh, I, I'm leaning somewhere between... Well, actually, I'm closer to Tom. Uh, as in, I think that, it, indeed, <laughs> the ending is very propagandistic. It's you know, really just building up the sense of, okay, we're going to rebuild everything, no more war. I, I just still think it's a tragic ending. I don't think that she is <laughs> convinced, convinced. I think she sees that it's over. Uh, I think that there's there might be a degree of the acceptance, whatever you want to call it, but, you know, you, the tears are still in her eyes as she's handing out the, the flowers. I think she's trying to reset or, or, or just trying to be in the moment for, for those who came back, but uh, I'm not sure if it's a truly, truly happy ending. Yeah, I guess I'm just not, not really getting that from her performance or, or from the way characters of films it, but I, 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 can, I can see that. I, I would like that. <laughs> I, would, I would like to get that from the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I, I am mixed too. I'm not 100% sure what is actually in, in, intended here either. I mean, to me, it's just an overwhelming tragedy throughout. There's many points throughout the film where the emotion gets the better of me. And just like Veronica, tears started falling in my eyes. I'm not afraid to admit it. This is one of the films that really moves me. And that final scene where she realizes that, that Boris did die during the war and the way in which she finds out just by her, by Boris's companion handing her the, the photograph of herself that, that Boris kept. I think that's a beautiful, touching moment, and I found it really hard to fight back the tears then because it's just this realisation she's been hoping 
all throughout the film and she's finally realized that Boris is no more and it for me it's utter tragedy and I don't think there's any other way to to interpret it than that yeah I think I wonder how how I would feel about it if we didn't see Boris die so early in the film right because maybe that would make it more more emotional for me I'm not sure because because since we see it so early on we know yeah we we know that her hope is pointless and it it doesn't feel like how, how should i put it I, I i don't i don't think i interpreted her as still thinking he was alive uh, throughout the film i think when she gets I and mean, yeah she does correct when when someone tells her someone uses the past to talk about him she does correct them i, I don't know if i fully believed that that she she still thought he was alive Maybe she does. Because for me, her hope kind of had an impact on me when watching it, even though I've seen the film, I know how it pans out. It's just the the way in which she seems to be, I mean, I want to say utterly devoted to him, but that (laughs) kind of isn't the case because of things that happen elsewhere in the story. But I I think upon receiving the final note that is revealed in in the squirrel that she she missed all this time and it, it kind of renews that sense of devotion and that sense of hope and I, I'm not sure whether it is 100% clear that Boris died in the scene when he's shot I think that Kolotisov films it in a way in which there is a possibility that he may survive he may go off to hospital you know obviously you see the flashbacks and Boris is seeing his life flash before his eyes but you don't know for certain and that kind of hope can be felt throughout as a viewer because mm. you kind of you root for Veronica and you know she's such an innocent character at the start and you want things to work out for her. So for me that was why the end was so tragic because as well as the realization for Veronica, it finally dawns on the viewer as well at, at the same time who you know, if you've been sharing in her hope that he's still alive, it hits that much harder. I actually think this is one of the more impressive elements, or, or if you think about dramaturgy, one of the more interesting, because uh, Boris is killed off very early. I think it's within the first uh, 30 or 40 minutes. I, I agree that you don't know 100% for sure. It seems quite, <laughs> you know, quite confirmed, but there's always that little bit of hope. And then, you know, the, uh, the man who was with him when he died comes and he tells the family about it. But, you know, he reveals he left with the other shoulders as, as uh, his friend was looking after Boris. So you always also, even there, even as, you know, it's the, the being informed, you think, oh, there's this slight slimmer of hope. And uh, I, I think this idea, this small shimmer of hope is just carried through the entire film. So... If that works for you, if you buy into that increasingly smaller sense of hope, uh, the ending is definitely even more powerful. Yeah, I guess I interpreted the death scene differently because to me, he really lays it on thick, Kalatozov, to make sure that we know he's dead. That's how I saw it. Because not only is there this whole fantasy sequence, which is remarkable, by the way, it's gorgeous, uh, with the whole superimposed thing. I mean, it's it's, it's amazing. Um, But also, right as he's dying, he's saying... Like there's this guy who comes, uh, this other soldier who comes to talk to him, and he he asks, "Are you wounded?" And he says, "I'm not wounded. I'm uh, basically." I mean, to <laughs> yeah. me, I thought, "Yeah, okay, I get it. He's dead." You know, but yeah, I did not think there was a doubt. But I guess if you interpreted it that way, I think that does make the film work better. Definitely, and I think this kind of way that lots of dangles hope is used throughout the film because boris's initial departure when he's off to war and veronica is trying to find him through the crowds throughout that you're hoping that she's going to make contact with him and be able to say you know farewell to him and it doesn't happen and then you've got boris's second departure his actual death which you'll depending on your interpretation you're potentially not sure about and and throughout you've got this hope that you know, maybe he's going to be alive. And then also when Veronica nearly meets Boris's companion who was there uh, when he was shot at the hospital, there's a moment where Boris's friend is, is on a bus full of all injured soldiers and Veronica's outside and you're, you're hoping that the two of them are, 
you're going to meet so she's going to have some clothes some kind of closure or more information and it doesn't happen at this point and it's really almost like a, a nerve shredding intense experience throughout because you're always hoping for these things to happen and for, for quite a short film it's, it's only just over an hour and a half there's so much drama and emotion and, and power packed into the story and it's just really impressive the work of cinema yeah it's gone with the wind in 90 minutes <laughs> yeah you can say that sure <laughs> do you want to say something on the marriage as well well what do you mean do you mean her decision to, to accept mark's advances Yeah, I mean, the, the thing with that is I'm not even sure if I read it as acceptance. I mean, it looks like it's, uh, to me, that felt like a rape scene, to be honest with you. I saw that. I did not think of it that way. I think that makes sense, but I did not read it that way. Uh, but I, I think that makes sense because I could not make sense of that scene. And so actually viewing it as a rape scene makes a lot of sense. I think I, I wish I had read it that way mm. um, because, yeah, otherwise... So to me, watching it, not not thinking of it that way, I was thinking, why is she accepting it? Right? It doesn't make sense for her character. But if we see it as rape, I, I think it, it does. It does work. We never see her positively affirm in any way or, or kiss him back. I mean, she hits him. She tries to run away at first. I mean, I, I guess again we're in the fifties, so you know, a woman, you know, not accepting advances, it's maybe a more. Uh, expected in terms of media but it, it's a really dark and horrifying scene to me especially with the, you know you have the bombs going all around them as well who are consistently trying to get away from him it's it's a pretty horrifying scene yeah, yeah i get it but I, i just interpreted it as she's resigned herself which works too I, yeah i just didn't think of it in, in those terms but yeah it does it does make sense i also didn't interpret it that way on watching it first time and when in in fact you mentioned chris in the in a group chat about the rape scene i was kind of like hang on uh, i don't i don't recall this at all and obviously there's the implication there but i was just thinking to myself this is a film that i i got for my mum for her birthday and she enjoyed it i was thinking surely there's not a rape <laughs> surely i wouldn't have gifted that to my mother and she enjoyed it of course it, obviously she, she loved the film too i think you, you hit the nail on the head with the mention of it being a really nightmarish scene though that um moment i almost got a, a feeling of watching a film influenced by german expressionism there's like these these really janky camera angles and the nightmarish combination of the bombs in the background and this classical music and for a moment you know the, I, i almost felt like i was watching scenes coming from nosferatu or something it's it's very powerful the, the way in which the the camera watches mark as he's coming towards veronica and it, it is a very powerful scene And, you know, when you mention the, the rape element, it does make a, a lot more sense for the, the overall story and, and how things develop between Mark and Veronica. Yeah, I definitely thought uh, of a German expressionism as well throughout the film, not just this scene. I, I yeah. think just in general, uh, it, it's a pretty clear influence to me. Yeah, I, I think the early scene, right, the, the, that romantic scene right at the start, I think it's also the way he shoots them, you know, it's all these very angular sets uh, around him well they're not sets i think it's just outside of in in st petersburg or leningrad uh, but yeah i, I definitely th saw that influence as well yeah i'll just completely agree there too and another favorite scene of mine that i'd, I'd like to mention is just this beautiful scene towards the end of the film where veronica is is in the house and and she's crying and slowly there's a fade And in the corner of an eye, her eye, like a, a tear starts to get brighter and brighter. And then the new shot comes into view and it's the lamp in the background of the house. And I just thought that was some wonderful editing that really conveys the emotion. And there's, there's many scenes like that throughout the film that just make you think, wow, that's, that's incredible. It's such great composition and everything is so well thought out and it really adds to the, to the feel of the film. Yeah. We didn't even mention the scene where she realizes her parents are dead when yes. she's running up the stairs after the bombing. And like, again, the wonderful staircase uh, movement with the camera. And then, you know, she gets to the door, she opens it and, you know, the entire apartment is just ripped out. This portions of the apartment is left. I mean, that's just absolutely heartbreaking for starters, but stunningly done as well. The use of fire as well in that scene. And it's... The use of elements is kind of consistent throughout these three films. 
and it seems to in, increase in magnitude throughout the films. But here it is is great when it really feels dangerous when she's running through the house and it's just being bombed. The flames feel so close and so real, and it's excellently shot. Yeah, and I did feel watching this film, oh, fire, interesting. I hope this doesn't awaken something in him, because <laughs> I know I know what's coming next. <laughs> We're going to have more fun with fire. I was going to say, is this is this a good segue to let it never scent? <laughs> it feels it, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. So fire. <laughs> um, I guess you can give a very brief uh, exposition of let it never scent. It's the story of a group of geologists and researchers who are trying to find diamonds in uh, on the Siberian taiga. I mean, that's that doesn't necessarily sound like the most exciting film, but to, to me, it's even more extraordinary than the cranes are flying, uh, including the, the the techniques. And it's one of the tensest, most anxiety-ridden tragedies I've seen. I mean, it, it's essentially a survivalist film. It, it's a, a part of disaster film. And without spoiling too much, we're going to have a spoiler section for, for this one too. It, it's just so thoroughly, powerfully done. And I, I guess we can say um, fire will come, as you see, even in the early scenes, as characters are working, digging, walking, you see there's this fading of fire over them, amplifying the heat, but also just giving us, again, a sense of what might just be to come. And once again, the characters are rather archetypical, you could say. Uh, and once again, just the camera movements are out of this world. And I would say that it, it stepped up a level. And uh, of course, we are uh, with this film. It's uh, three years later. So a lot of development has come. Handheld camera movements have become a little bit more of a norm, let's say, after the advent of the French New Wave again. But this one, again, blows everything else in 1960 out of the water, as far as I'm concerned. So I don't admire Let Never Sent as much as The Cranes Are Flying. I still think it's an incredible film, and it is a favourite of mine. It, it's, it's a superb work. As Chris mentioned, the camera work, again, is just out of this world. The opening scenes are incredible when the group of explorers, these pioneers, are left alone in the Siberian wasteland and the helicopter flies out of view and the the amazing shots just as we circling the pioneers and getting further and further away it's it's beautiful and these shots continue throughout and the scenery is incredible the, the Siberian wasteland the, the differences in the terrain as the the film progresses and the elements come into play and cause havoc for the, the researchers. is beautiful. And one um, nice thing I'd like to mention about this film, it was one of the, the first discoveries I made when I joined iCheck Movies Then, of course got became more involved in the iCheck Movies forum. So this was my first kind of exposure to incredible films outside of the IMDb Top 250. It was like, wow, there's a, there's a world of films that exist outside of that, that are just as brilliant, if not better, and films that are not as, as well known. And, and this was my gateway into the Colossus of films that we're discussing today. So it does hold a special place in my heart, even if I do slightly prefer The Cranes Are Flying. So I, I prefer this to Cranes Are Flying because I think the nature of this story is better suited to Kalatozov's style for me. Because as you mentioned, Chris, this is a survival film. It's a thriller, whereas uh, Currents Are Flying was more of a tragic melodrama. And just because this is a thriller, the fact that the characters are kind of thin is not as, as important to me, right? Because it's all, just all about watching them in this environment and watching Kalatozov have fun. Uh, well, I guess maybe fun is not the right word, but he, yeah, it, it, it's kind of the same story as, as the previous film in, in, in the sense of my reaction to it. It's just incredibly impressive. There's, there's no, no other way to describe it. I don't know, Chris, do you have like a specific scene that you think is, is a standout? I, I mean, in terms of scenes, I think uh, it's completely related to what, to what impresses me the most about this, but it's just this early scene where two of the characters go out hunting and the camera is with them in the swamp and uh, it just kind of 
when most of the characters sees, sees the bird and shoots, the camera just pans with such dramatic action, and you see one of them picking out of the bird. It's that's just one of those examples of how alive the camera is here. It, it's just stunning, and it, it it's visceral. It's just terribly, terribly visceral. It kind of just shakes you awake. But in terms of why I love this film, and it, it went up a lot on my recent rewatch is just how anxious uh, it made me and also just like we, we can we can uh, spoil it and say that our geologist gets caught in a forest fire i mean even uh, even most of the uh cover uh the uh, blu-ray covers of the film uh dvd covers posters etc they all kind of show the fires so let's just say the, the disaster element here is that there is a massive forest fire that our uh, four protagonists have to fight through and uh, survive and this how long the fire continues and the way the characters they have to duck under burning branches there's fire around them at all points it, it, it just you don't know what's going to happen next trees are falling they're in the river they're, they're just at one point they just separate from the river and try to walk through the fire and uh, it's just burning around them at all points it's almost exhausting to watch and it's just all consuming it, it it's really is like that part of the uh, part of the film it's just it is one of the finest thrillers and disaster films ever made in my opinion and like there's very few other films that's made me that anxious yeah i guess to me the standout is the fire right everything like maybe the last 20 minutes of the film or so i don't know how they did it did they just let the like let the um, how do you say it Watch the entire forest. <laughs> yeah, did, they, did they just light the forest yeah. on fire? Did they just yeah. do that? They probably uh, did. I'm sure they could. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't even understand how it's safe from the ca- for the camera person because our, our characters they have to walk through the fires like they're, they're literally diving under or just covering their heads under this burning branches everywhere, burning logs, and but the camera has to follow them as well and just in these long shots track them and like it seems like the camera is also because it's so close to them at many times it's in the middle of the fire as well. I just I, I'm not even sure if the crew was fully safe. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's. Just uh, stunning that they, like it's incredible that they managed to do this. It feels like if that scene was made today, it would be done with CGI. It, it, it's it's oh, that good. It's just like how on earth is, yeah. unless perhaps someone like Christopher Nolan came along and was like, "We're doing it for real." <laughs> it would be CGI. It's it's just amazing. Even Nolan, even anyone like you, just wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> yeah. just, and considering <laughs> considering the ultimate message of this film, if you want to go into spoilers, uh, I guess it makes sense that you would risk <laughs> people's lives for uh, a scene like that. I like Chris how you mentioned how the the camera feels alive as well because there are few static shots in Letter Never Sent. It's primarily just the fluid movement of the handheld camera, and it, is, it just displays such an impressive command of the medium. Kolotov and his cinematographer working together, just such an incredible team, and I wish they'd have made more films like this. <laughs> yes, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there aren't that many films like this even, and they just even in the build-up scenes before there's a fire, like the way the camera moves. I mean, there's there's some like I guess fifty second or even more than a minute long takes where the camera just you know it starts off with a close up of one character, that character walks away, we start following the character, it moves into somebody else's, there's a close up of them, there's you know it's kind of this you kind of build the scene of the camp with these long takes. Like I said, the camera is never still. The angles, once again, like German Expressionist influence are clear. When they're digging, you know, you, sh- you see them from where they dig, hammering in over the camera. It- it's just such a physical film, and that's taken into the forest fire. I and mean, that's not even a scene. Like, that's almost majority of the film is just fire, 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 fire. Literally days in, in the story are spent inside of this fire as, you know, the, the situation just gets more and more desperate. E- even something like this massive phone they're carrying around, uh, radio, radio phone they're carrying around, like they, they, they cannot signal with the command, but the command signals to them. And, you know, for a long time before they know there's a fire, they just signal praises because they found the diamonds. Especially when they also start sending hopes, uh, messages of hope, it just gets increasingly, increasingly tr- just tragic with that simple device. 
Uh, and of course, you also just have, again, like with Queens are Flying, so much focus on the faces. And so much for, like covered in dirt uh, and and smog. Uh, it's again one of those things that just makes it so exhausting. I think part of what makes it feel so intense and also immersive as well is the movement of the camera. It, it makes you feel like you're a fifth member of the party. You're there with them, traveling to the edge of the world in search of these endless riches and place in the Soviet Union's history books. And it just feels like you're you're with them the whole way and experiencing this. And, you know, that really adds to the intensity and the feeling of the film. I'm wondering, is this like a founding film for the survival genre? Because this is something we see kind of a lot, at least this idea, right? We are following these characters and we are going to see them face uh, something that is really difficult to deal with. And it, it's very gripping. You know, all of this you described, I think, is something that is really familiar, if, though it's rarely done as well. Is there a previous example? I guess I don't, I can think of one, but may, maybe you guys can. I don't know. I mean, that's Robinson Crusoe count. <laughs> Which one? Which one? <laughs> no, any of them. I mean, do they count as survival films? Um... I think I've got kind of one. I don't know how you feel about the wages of fear. Yes. Oh, yes. That's, that's a good could one. kind of be viewed as a survival film. No, yeah, I definitely think that that counts. I, th I think that um, it's not as pure as this, but, yeah, but it, it, it does. But I guess, I guess with Wages of Fear, we should do an episode on that at some point. It's just that it's a choice. Here, it's not a choice. So yeah. I, I, they we kind of have like the psychological element uh, as well. Yeah, I, I cannot think of a proper, like a proper uh, disaster survival film from the 50s. I, I just... Like you have lifeboats, but every, but that's not the survival film, really. That's just like it's not in the same way. It's not constant disasters. They just have to survive. So yeah, I, I can't think of any right now, and that's <laughs> I guess that that puts the film into an even more impressive context. But I, I, I guess if I want to to discuss the film more, I would have to get into the ending, into what the film is is saying. Mm. Uh, do, are you guys ready to move on to spoilers? Yeah, I think I think we talked about just how, like, I mean, like you said, the, the characters are archetypes. I mean, we could mention that the uh, female lead in this one, Tatiana Samaloya, is the same lead as uh, in Cranes Are Flying. So uh, anyone who were captivated by her performance there should definitely continue on. And she's incredible in this film as well. Yes, she's a lovable presence, right? In both films, it's someone mm -hmm. who is very easy to attach yourself to. I guess that's what she brings. And uh, with that, let's uh, let's spoil the hell of it. Uh, bring it on, Matthew. Spoiler warning. Yeah, so the film ends with, of course, everyone's dead. And the whole point of the film is, well, it's all worth it, because now we have this diamond mine <laughs> that will be here later. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I agree. <laughs> you know, maybe there are some things worth sacrificing your life for, but... Building a diamond mine in the middle of the Siberian forests, I'm not sure that's really it. For me. I mean, I guess I can uh, add to this that, uh, <laughs> that uh, once again, you know, it is the propaganda elements that bring in this film a little bit down. I mean, this is a, this is a favorite for me, absolutely. But, you know, you, you have this drive to become heroes of the Soviet Union. You have these dreams of, like, we didn't say this in the non-spoiler version, but like the, the last 20 minutes or so, uh, the danger uh, changes from fire to ice and snow as the winter sets. And uh, it's just as uh, deadly and horrifying an opponent. And, you know, you have uh, our, our last surviving member of the expedition just kind of going, trying to find any way to bring the location down to civilization because he has the coordinations to where the diamonds were found. And he's, you know, he, he builds like this makeshift raft where he's partially in the icy river. He, he lifts a fire to the edge of it to kind of try to keep himself warm. And he kind of just drifts along the river and hallucinates. And part of that hallucination is seeing, you know, an industrial revolution that will be caused by these findings. So, I mean, the propaganda element is quite strong, though. I mean, I do understand it to a point because, like, within the story, they talk about how, you know, they don't have uh, diamond production in the Soviet Union. They have to import it. This will essentially create an industrial revolution. It would help them with space travel, like all of these contemporary issues <laughs> that like are in the zeitgeist. And so, so I can see it, the propaganda element is a bit strong, but it, it does work to, to a point. And, and just one final point, you mentioned that everyone dies. 
Um, that's how I remember the film too, but I, I think it's worth noting that at the very end, when, you know, you see our, like, at this point, our very clear protagonist, since he's our last uh, survivor, just uh, laying in the eyes and, you know, the rescuers come, th- there is this moment when he opens his eyes. And I'm not sure if he dies there or not, but th- there is the possibility that, that he survives. This sounds like a, another split of opinions like in the crane of flying is it clear whether <laughs> Boris dies or not <laughs> it's the same thing again you know maybe there is that glimmer of hope in the end it has been a few years since I've watched Lesson Never Since so I can't recall the my exact interpretation of the ending but I had it in my head that none of them made it out alive but it, it is interesting to hear that mm. perhaps yeah. that is not the case yeah, yeah. Again, I guess again, I interpreted it as they did, but <laughs> the, I, I didn't. I didn't rewatch it uh, as recently as Cranes Are Flying, so I can be one hundred percent sure. The the fantasy, like the industrialist fantasy you mentioned, Chris, I think really sums up where the film has a problem right now, right? Because of so of course, Kalatozov did not know about climate change, but we do. <laughs> so it's, it's it's just hard to watch uh, this kind of idealized. Yeah, the, the, the whole point of the, of the character's sacrifice is supposed to be this. And it just does not look like a positive thing in today's, you know, in, on, in our eyes. And so that's, that's not the film's fault to a point, but it's just hard to, to deal with, I, I think, for this film. And so you're left with an experience that is remarkable, that is absolutely thrilling. And, uh, there, there are these small stories that kind of, animate the the whole film right the kind of unrequited love and the opposition between the nerdy guy and the more strong guy right again archetypal stuff all of that works you're, you're fully in with them but yeah when it comes to finding the film's points i think yeah it, it does lose me i still like it a lot it's it's still remarkable but that is where it loses me and that is the story of kanatosov's films i guess at least the ones i've seen those three is it's always the formalists fighting with the propagandist. <laughs> and yeah, there's, there's one I like more than the other. And uh, talking about formalism, um, is this a good segue to Soy Cuba? Uh, sure. Yeah. We mentioned earlier that Galatasaray had, had you know, run-ins with most films with charges of formalism. And that happened again for very obvious reasons with uh, Soy Cuba, a.k.a. I am Cuba, which was a Soviet Union slash Cuban co-production set out to celebrate the uh, Cuban revolution. And uh, this was shot during the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis as well, it's worth noting. it's. One of the most visually spectacular works ever committed to film, at least in my mind, the camera is freer than ever before. I'm sure we're going to dive into the nightclub sequence, the rooftop sequence, which is just utterly insane, and and so many of the other just incredibly set pieces there. It's a film in segments, kind of meant to depict Cuba before and up to, or rather into the revolution. You're know, starting us out with, you know, more sleazy Americans and like kind of the excess of Cuba giving us the terrible or the more um, unforgiving lives of the actual Cubans living in poverty and then leaning into the sense of revolution. Um, and through all of this, it's just, again, more striking than ever before. This is, once again, a, a favorite of mine, though, it, it, at least to me, and this you might discuss what, some of the negatives too. Some of the audio is a bit, a little bit off, and some of the uh, English-speaking uh, actors, <laughs> they're not the best. So, so there are some setbacks here, for sure, but like in terms of just cinematic language, the camera movements, everything there, this is just one of the most impressive films ever made. Well, I think the interesting thing about this episode is that you, you mentioned uh, Letter Never Sense being your favorite of the three, Chris, I'm correct? Yes, that's correct. Well, so Kuba is my favorite, so we all have a different favorite. Uh, about that's amazing. The three. And I think the reason it's my favorite is, you know, I mentioned with Letter Never Sense that the the format is maybe better suited to Karatozov. Well, I think this is even better suited because we've got these four segments and we've got this very kind of theoretical idea binding the film together, which is kind of this 
observation of the Cuban Revolution. And both of those things really work well with Kalatos of Strengths, right? Which has, which are very kind of big and theoretical. And again, with the, the archetypical characters, which I think work even better in this film than they do in the previous one, right? It, it doesn't really matter who the characters are as individuals because we're exploring the idea of the Cuban people and this revolution. And I think another part of it, of it, which makes it my favorite is that I do find ambiguity in there. You know, I mentioned earlier, I couldn't find it in the ending of Cranes of Flying, as, as you guys could. But here, especially that first sequence where we are kind of seeing this kind of decadent capitalistic society with the Americans, right? It, it's clearly meant to depict that. But I think there is complexity in there because it's so much fun. <laughs> and I think Galatasov cannot help but make it so much fun. And... You know, so maybe there, maybe debauchery and decadence is not all bad. I, I don't know. That, that's how I feel watching, watching that part, even though the overall point is clear, but there is just, just that bit of, you know, the, the music, it, 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 the music and the camera, they are dancing together in a way that I, I think adds complexity to it. Maybe it's just in my mind, but, uh, it, it's enough for me to make the whole film work better. And I also think, the way he shoots like the peasant dealing with his crop. In one way, it is like pure Soviet representation, right? It, it very almost, um, uh, almost, uh, it's like, it's iconic, right? Uh, in a way that could be bad, but I think it's just, it is so beautiful. I think it is really, even technically, I think it is even above the, the other two in, in how accomplished it is. At least to me, it's even more, more impressive an achievement uh, than the other two. I would agree with you that technically it is a step above his his previous films and I certainly admire that and again it is another favourite film of mine but because the film is split into four segments I feel that's where it loses the kind of uh, emotional power that Kalatas have found within The Cranes of Flying and, and Letter Never Sent. Certainly an impressive technical achievement and the themes that he's dealing with are grand and they're impressive and his messages comes across well but it, it doesn't quite tug at the heartstrings for me but it you know it is another incredible film and i think what's even more impressive about this is that it, it, it took a while to to reach the western world because it was a communist production and as you said, it was shot during the Bay of Pigs. And it was only in the 90s when it began to surface in, in the US in some festivals and was championed by Scorsese, among others, that it, it finally became recognised for the, the stunning piece of cinema it is. And I always find it interesting when films kind of, you know, are, are almost lost to time. And it, it, it makes you wonder how many films are, are released every year that just kind of get pushed to one side because of political circumstances or other aspects that, you know, maybe technically brilliant films, stunning films that, that, that we're missing. And I'm, I'm just glad that this is one that, it, you know, found its way into the, the zeitgeist and is now revered for the amazing piece of cinema that it is. Yeah, I mean, even in the Soviet Union, it was barely shown at all because uh, the authorities were so disappointed with it. They thought it was just uh, an art film. They didn't want an art film. They wanted a propaganda film. I, I think I read that it only did, it was only shown in eight theaters in the whole of the Soviet Union, which is just uh, insane. More shown in Cuba, but uh, apparently the reception wasn't that great there either. <laughs> so <laughs> it really took a long time for this to become the venerated the, the classic that it is today with the amount of accolades it has achieved so late in its uh, life. That just is spectacular. And I just want to say I agree with both of you. Technically, this is far superior to Letter Never Sent and the Cranes Are Flying. I mean, I'm going to dive into the camera work uh, soon. It's just out of this world almost. I mean, if anyone made this film today, this would still be all just incredible. Uh, like, as in terms of just how they managed to do it. I mean, we have more long take films now, obviously, but this would still be one of the most impressive. Any year this film would be released, it would be one of the most impressive in camera work, no matter what. Even if the techniques used here, the way some films move now, uh, this has become slightly, 
slightly more common. Uh, I mean, I, I would even like it, watching this. I even thought about uh, Terrence Malick, to be honest with you, like the way that you know his late films that is uh, move and float. And, of, and, and especially during, you know, the sequence with the farmers, you know, with the uh, sugar canes, you know, going through the canes, uh, etc. But the camera is just so wonderfully free. Uh, in, in terms of your uh, comment on the first segment there, Mathieu, where you said that, you know, it, it kind of shows just how fun the excess is. I, I do actually think that was part of the point, where it, kinda, it starts off just showing all of this excess all of how fun these Americans have it. Uh, and then it kind of shows the backside to it. Towards the end of that segment, our American lead is quite horrified and disgusted by, you know, what, what he suddenly sees, how actual Cubans live. The fun is kind of gone. And I, I do think that that messaging works really well. But this first segment also has, and, and finally, because I've been dying to talk about the camera work, probably the D2 best takes in the film, you have the close to opening take on the rooftop. We start off with this kind of beauty contest, you know, again, showing the excesses. It goes through this party, shows this luxury swimming pool, the guests there. It keeps swinging, it goes up to the edge of the skyscraper, then turns back and falls. The woman actually goes into the water. And then a little bit later, he said, mentioned the dance sequence. You have this young woman who's working at this place essentially as a hostess, semi prostitute, and you know the Americans kind of just just throw her between them as the camera moves. It's horrifying and beautiful at the same time because you follow her, her face, and she kind of gets slung through the room. And if, again, the camera, I cannot think of any scene honestly where the camera is as alive and vibrant at this point in time as during this sequence. Yeah, just to make it clear. Uh, I'll let you speak, Tom, but just to like, let, make it clear, I do get the point of the first part, right? I do get that. The idea is that all of this is being made at the expense of the Cuban people who are being exploited. And I think that's quite clear, and that's a point I like better than let's let's sacrifice lives for a diamond mine. But I, I, I just think there is more ambiguity in there, and that, that's what I meant. I think one thing that makes the camera work so brilliant in, in that scene within the club is that the scene itself is so chaotic you know with the dancing and everything that's going on but the camera work is still somehow controlled and follows all this beautifully and it's it's just exceptional it is great camera work but i think that my favorite camera work comes later on in the third segment during the funeral procession and it's just one of those shots where you're like how on earth was this filmed oh yeah and um, when the camera is following the funeral procession down a main street and then all of a sudden it starts rising up towards the, the top of a building and then the camera goes onto this rooftop um, and you're just wondering how on earth they've managed this for the angles and it uh, tracks along the roof following, um, uh, I think it's a cigar factory, people are rolling cigars. Yeah, it just goes through the window and then you see all of these bit workers doing their individual task and the camera just really goes into it as well. It was just amazing to see. Yeah, exactly. And then it, it goes past them and then it goes, it, it leaves the roof and it starts following the procession again down the street and you're just like, this is incredible. And it, it's like this own separate story within a story when you're just seeing what's going on the inner workings of them creating the you know making rolling the the cuban cigars and it's just a nice uh, well that it's just a brilliant touch it's 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 incredible and it, it's one of those that just leaves you dumbfounded like how on earth was this filmed and i love it because films nowadays if they're looking to achieve something like this there's easier ways to do it with you know cgi um, technical wizardry with the cuts and editing but you know watching this because of the era it's made this was all done as you see it and it's it's just breathtaking it's brilliant yeah i think it, you you mentioned chris that uh, we have a lot of long takes now and i was watching all quiet on the western front the other day and it has long takes everywhere and why why don't they feel why why don't they feel as good <laughs> for for most of the time and i think part of it is that the camera, and you mentioned this uh, with Letter Never Sent, that the camera is almost a character, that you can feel the camera moving. And the, the way you feel this movement, this physical movement, I think makes it all seem more real, it, 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 because it is, than even real camera movements today, which are so smooth 
that they feel inhuman. I, th I think there's there's something in there, something in how you can feel the camera's movement in these incredible long takes. We should we should describe in that they are uh, in, insane. Like it, as you said, Chris, it's hard to even imagine how this was achieved, and yet you can feel the physicality behind it. And I think that's what makes it even more immersive, maybe. Yeah, and I think it's also composition uh, plays in here. I mean, there, there are some really impressive films with long takes. I mean, Athena, just from last year, for instance, where you have like this 10-minute uh, opening uh, raid of a police station, but it still doesn't have the same kind of visual energy. Like, part of that could, could just be like you're talking about that you can kind of feel it in a different way here. But with a lot of these films with long takes, they don't have the, I'm not sure if I'm going to say Overcomposition. I'm not sure if that's that's the right thing, but back in the 60s, you, you were shooting on film. Film stock was extremely valuable. You had to get it right. You know the amount of rehearsals, the amount of like making sure that each like each frame essentially were perfect. And it, it feels like when you have longer takes today, they kind of don't have the same just ter truly incredible uh, compositions like with every single camera movement just hope, kind of hoping that okay the camera movement and the take itself is impressive enough uh, but here just like you could freeze frame almost every shot in this film and it will look at the very least not terribly good but usually the spectacular and incredible so uh, new new films uh, take note I, I guess uh, like comparison with Malik I guess Malik does that to an extent where you know his films do feel beautifully composed and there are some others that you know uh, do do that but it's very very rare and that's again one of the reasons just why I Am Cuba still stands out like if this was released this year it would still be probably the most impressive film technically of the year and that is the true testament to the craftsmanship here but but I think what makes Malik work is that uh, it's a bit of a that tangent, but is that the smoothness of the camera move works because often with Terence Malik, it's the camera is God, right? I mean, or some kind of superior entity. Mm, you can yeah, it's a good interpretation. Yeah. Whereas here the camera is human, and I think that mm. you know, that's kind of the contrast I would make. I would also add that, of course. We end up talking a lot about the long takes with, with Soy Kuba because that's what is immediately impressive. But one of those long takes, what it ends with a moment that is, uh, where I think uh, it's where the student is thrown off a window. I, I don't, I don't remember now. He's shot and he keeps throwing the pamphlet until he, uh, just falls over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's shot. And this is a pure moment of montage, right? Of Soviet, of good old fashioned Soviet montage. And it, it works just as well. It's like, the whole package of the cinematic tools that he had at his disposal that he's using for various things, because that moment is just as impressive technically as, as anything else in the movie, I think. Maybe not that difficult to achieve, but impressive in, in what, well, what it communicates, what, how it uses the form to, to communicate an idea. Yeah, I, I think you're right there. I think that it's just not just long takes. There's, like you said, there's montage. There's a lot of iconography almost because once again, you know, the characters aren't, you know, proper characters. All of them represent something else essentially, which, which once again really fits Kalotsov's uh, style. Yeah, that, that peasant sequence, you could use it. You could use stills from that sequence to illustrate you know, a Soviet ideology about, you know, agrarian uh, ideology. It's like all of it boiled down to single images in a way that I think is, is, is quite amazing. I don't mind the, the characters being archetypes as much in this because it's clearly not the point in these other two movies. I think we are supposed to get attached to the characters to a point at least. I think here it's not even, we're not even pretending. And so I think that's why. Uh, may, maybe the main student, maybe Maria in the first segment, but yeah, not, 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 not really, no, not in the same way, no. I mean, there is this, in the last segment, and I don't want to spoil it too much, I don't think we really, or you can't really spoil, uh, Soy Cuba, <laughs> because it is like a hugely visual film, but you have like this disaster element again, where a family is just put through the bombs and they're trying to run away, which, you know, sent my mind flashing back to, uh, Latin Arizona, because it's, to get this really visceral. I, I think you meant to care whether or not the day and the children survive, but again, they're not really characters. And I, I completely agree with you that you know, all of these characters are far less characters than the previous films. And in those films, they were also archetypes. And I think 
this is definitely what Tom mentioned, why he didn't connect with this film as much. And I think people who are more narrative probably will not connect to this film as much either. Definitely. I agree with what you're saying there, Chris. Though I also think that there is strength in the narrative in, in all four segments. In, in fact, the stories are all brilliant and could potentially have been extended to be full-length features themselves. But given the, the short nature and the fact that the characters don't have much depth, that's why I, I struggle to, to connect with it on an emotional level. But there is a lot of intensity throughout most of the segments. Uh, most of all, the uh, my favourite segment, the I think it was the second one, where the sugar plantation is taken from the um, uh, man who has farmed it for his whole life. And again, this is a sequence involving fire. And it it's just stunning. It is is breathtaking, and you know it does it does still pull at the heartstrings, but just not as as much as the the previous two efforts. But I, I mean, I have to say that Soy Cube is another favourite of mine. It's it's just an excellent film. But it doesn't quite reach the heights of his his previous two films. I would say the one thing holding me back with Soy Cube is at the very end there is this kind of triumphant music over i think the revolutionary army which i think is just this one bit too much it kind of reminds me of the the ending of 12 angry men where i wish i could cut like 10 seconds of it where you have the jurors walking out of the courthouse and there's this triumphant music and you you know if i just could do, if i could could just cut these 10 seconds in both films i, I would be i would be happier but other than that i just i just love it I mean, that, that was the whole point of the film existing in the first place. We had to do it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But, but yeah, no, I, I think, uh, I think you bring up a valid point here, which is that, I mean, like we talked about with two previous films as well, the propaganda elements do drag them down a little bit. And this film is obviously the most overtly propagandistic, despite still being the most overtly visual, it, it, because it was ordered as propaganda. I mean, it was dismissed by the authorities and kind of just thrown away because it was what it ended up being. But, I mean, what they ordered and what they paid the Colossal to you know, go to Cuba for was that propaganda film. Definitely. The overt propaganda at the end is my niggle that, that brings us down here you know, in my estimations as well. The music and just the surge of the soldiers marching on, it, it is just a bit too much. Um, obviously, the political propaganda is present in all three films that we discussed, but this one does seem to push it just a little bit too much for my liking. And, and as you said, Chris, it's, it's madness to think that it, despite going this far, it didn't satisfy those who financed the film for those reasons. It is, it is crazy to think that. Yeah, I mean, it, it didn't bother me as much as you because I'm kind of used to it. And also, <laughs> I was far more bothered by some of uh, his uh, older uh, propaganda films where it's even more uh, extreme. I, I will say that anyone who enjoys the filmmaking here, they should really go back to see his two oldest surviving films, Salt for uh, Svanisha and especially Nail in the Boot. Salt for Smith ends in a similar, like, hyper propagandistic note, which brings it down a little bit for me, but, like, shots and the compositions, they really feel like these later films. And the same goes for Nail in the Boot. It's just a mastery of excess and formalism. Uh, it, it's also worth just noting that the cinematographer that he worked with, Sergei Urevsky, he also did one more film with, uh, Kolotosov called The First Echelon, which he did the year before the cranes are flying and it's still visually breathtaking it's far more of a melodrama so i'm not sure if i would recommend it <laughs> to the same extent but if you enjoy these three films that's another reasonable place to go and a warning against his last film at the red tent which you know amongst other stars peter finch and sean connery was a, a lush huge co-production with Italy. Uh, I think the first big uh, co-production outside of the Iron Curtain for the Soviet Union. Um, it's not very good. I mean, I, I saw the director's cut. That's the one that doesn't have the Ennio Morricone score. Uh, I hear that the shorter version is meant to be better. I might see that at one point. There's still some exciting camera work, but it's just, no, it's, it's just, it doesn't work the same way at all. But, I think from all three of us, The Cranes Are Flying, Leather Never Sent, 
and I Am Cuba are just highly recommended. You've heard us talk about just the technical uh, excellence and just the incredible nature of these films. Uh, you heard us talk about how, you know, swapped up in it we are, how, how, how we can't even believe some of this stuff was even captured or done. So if you haven't seen any of these films or you're missing some of them, just do yourself the favor and dive into them because they're some of the greatest films ever made. Can I just add, Chris? Sorry to interrupt. I think it's worth mentioning because you pointed this out to me that if you haven't seen The Cranes Are Flying, you can watch it on YouTube because Moss Film have made it available and it's in a high resolution. It's a great transfer as well. So, yeah, you can just go on YouTube and watch it for free and enjoy. Yeah, exactly. Go right ahead. Enjoy. Watch it today. So, uh, with that recommendation, thank you so much for listening and join us again soon. You have been listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of ICMforum.com.